We watch the breath so that we can watch the mind. The breath is like a mirror for the mind. When you look at the way you breathe, you can get a good sense of what's going on in the mind. When you get really familiar with the breath, you can begin to detect things that are happening in the mind. When there's greed, when there's anger, when there's delusion, it does show up in the breath. And you find, though, that not only does the breath reflect the mind, but you can use the breath to have an effect on the mind as well. Say, when there is anger, you can consciously change the rhythm of your breathing, and that'll have an effect on the mind. So the principle of cause and effect goes both ways here. The mind has an effect on the breath, and the breath can have an effect on the mind. But to get the most use out of that principle, you have to be willing to spend a lot of time with the breath to get to know it, to explore how the whole process of breathing happens in the body. And there are times when you have to be gentle in the exploration. You start surveying the body, you begin to notice there are whole parts that seem to have disappeared. Your shoulder may be gone, it seems, or part of your back. Place down the hips. And our immediate reaction when we notice something like that is to barge right in and try to straighten things out. That's an area where you have to be very careful and be very observant. The hip hasn't gone anywhere, the shoulder hasn't gone anywhere. It's there. It's just that on a subconscious level, you've hooked it up in a strange way. And so you have to be very, very observant. Watch for a while to see exactly where are things hooked up, and where might you suggest a few new ways of hooking things up. Because if you go in just barging into those parts of the body, they close up even more. It's like someone who's used to being abused, and then someone comes in to help them in an aggressive way. They, they just experience that as more abuse, so they close up. So the trick is being patient, watching, nudging a little here, nudging a little there, see what works, see what doesn't work. And bit by bit, as you get more familiar with the body, more familiar with the breath, things will begin to settle down, things will begin to connect up. So be willing to get to know this one thing very well. There's an old Russian proverb, I understand, that talks about two different kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge of the fox and the knowledge of the hedgehog. The fox knows a lot of things, but very superficially. The hedgehog knows only one thing, but it knows it through and through. And so what we're working on here as we meditate is hedgehog knowledge. You really want to know the breath. Once you've got the breath, then you've got a really good position for observing the mind. And even in the course of exploring the breath, you learn about, a lot about the mind as well. You get a sense of how the mind focuses on things, exactly what is awareness, how many layers are there. There's the focal point of awareness, and then there's that background awareness. fills the whole body. It's there already. It's simply a matter of getting in touch with it learning to live there with the background and keep our awareness of that background open as much as we can. Because all too commonly, when we focus on one thing, we try to close off as many other things as possible just to have that focus. And that puts huge areas of our awareness in, in the shadows. And sometimes that's necessary, and sometimes it's not. But to unlearn the habit, we have to be very persistent in trying to keep this. Once you get a sense of the whole body, try to keep that as open as much as you can. That's where the, the skill comes in. It's not some sort of mystic spaciousness where you're getting in touch with 
Buddha nature or anything like that. It's simply your background awareness. It's there. And there's a question of being consciously in touch with it, being consciously open with it or not. And when you're more in touch with the background, then you begin to notice the, the point or the focus of the mind here, there, wherever it moves. And you're less likely to get knocked off by changes in the focal point. In other words, if your concentration is totally limited to one focal point, as soon as anything disturbs it at all, you're gone. And so you've lost the concentration. But if it encompasses that background, then even though there may be a little bit of wavering in your focal point, you've still got that background. Your foundation is still there. So stay here with the breathing. Be observant and be patient, because getting to know the breath, getting to know the mind are long-term processes. We've lived so much of our lives in ignorance of our own mind, in ignorance of our own breath. So it's going to take a while to really get to know them. So each time you meditate, open your mind to the possibility you may learn something new. Because there's always something new here to notice, even though it seems to be familiar territory. There are lots of details to explore, and it's in focusing on the details, getting to know them, that you can learn a lot. This is a common theme throughout the teachings. Simple things we do every day are the things you should st we should study, because everything we need to know is right in there. The whole question of intention and attention that the Buddha points out is lying at the basis of so much of our suffering. It's right here in our actions. What things do we attend to? How do we look at things? And then how do we make up our minds to do things? And we wake up, make up our minds to do things. What's the motivating factor? You dig down not too deep and you find that it's, it's a quest for happiness. We do things because we think we'll be happier by doing them. Psychologists have shown that people are amazingly ignorant about what's going to ha give them happiness and what's not things they've done many, many times before, and they know it's not all that satisfying a happiness, but they still do them again and again, partly because of the familiarity. They feel better doing something they're familiar with, and secondly, because they haven't really examined what they're doing, what the results are, and how it might be improved. So we've talked many times about the Buddha's instructions to his son, Rahula, saying that before you do something, look at your intention and ask, is this something that's going to lead to happiness or not? either for yourself or for other people? Or is it going to cause pain? If it's going to cause pain and suffering, don't do it. Act only on the intentions that aim at happiness and aim at well-being. And then while you're doing it, check the results, because some results come immediately. You stick your hand in a fire, you know immediately it's hot, you pull it out. So if you see that the, the action is having some unintended results that are actually causing suffering, and the happiness you hope for is not going to come, okay, then you drop the action, you stop. And then when you've done, if it turned out it was, seemed okay while you were doing it, but then when you're done, then you check the long-term results. What's interesting is the Buddha says at the end of this, when he says that this is how you reflect on your thoughts, on your words and your deeds, he says it's in acting this way that you purify your thoughts, words and deeds. We very rarely think of the question of purity as being tied up to the quest for happiness. But the Buddha says that's where you find purity, is really getting perceptive, getting intelligent about how you look for happiness, when you really observe how you're looking for happiness. So the quest for happiness is not a bad thing. I was talking yesterday to someone who had said after her academic career being trained as a psychologist, she never took the issue of happiness all that seriously. It seemed like something that would come or go pretty randomly. And she was amazed to discover that the Buddha had devoted a whole body of teaching just to that one issue, the quest for happiness. But when you come right down to it, what else is there? If we're not conscious about our quest for happiness, it goes underground, and then we don't know what we're doing. So the Buddha says, bring it up into the open. Even when you're breathing, notice that when you start focusing on the breath, there's an natural tendency to want the breath to be comfortable. Well, follow that tendency. Don't fight it. 
Don't push it on the ground. Look at your actions in every aspect, aspect, aspect of life and see where the happiness is that you're looking for, and to see if it's actually being produced by what you do. And a lot of times our unskillful actions, the things that we repeat, not because they don't produce any happiness at all, but they give us a little bit, but we focus only on that little bit and we ignore the larger suffering we're causing. So you want to look to see both where the gratification is and where the drawbacks of those actions are. And once you really see that, see both sides, and then you can compare them. Are the, the drawbacks worth? Are they worth it? Is the gratification worth it? Once you're clear and above board with yourself about both sides, then you can start looking for the way out, looking for the escape. The Buddha said that insight basically comes down to five things, seeing things arise, seeing them pass away. This is not just experiences arising and passing away like watching things on a TV screen. It's decisions you make, intentions you have. They arise. They pass away. That's the really interesting arising and passing away. You see things arise, pass away. You see their gratification. You see their drawbacks. And then you see their escape. That's complete knowledge. That's the kind of knowledge we're working on here. Give the mind a good, solid basis so it can watch things come and go. Watch its intentions come and go. When it decides to act, see what happens as the action is taking place. And then when the action is done, does it totally go or does it leave a trace? What gratification do you get out of the action? What are the drawbacks of the action? When you compare the, the gratification to the drawbacks. What kind of balance do you get? And if it's not worth it, what are you going to do to gain release from it? In other words, if it's an action that's really not all that helpful, if the gratification isn't worth it, what are you going to do to stop? What other things are you going to do in its place to find happiness instead? The Buddha doesn't tell us to give up our search for happiness. He tells, tells us to become more intelligent in how we do it, more observant. And what's amazing is through that process, we ultimately purify our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. We purify our mind. Because where our big ignorance lies is right here, in what we're doing to try to gain happiness and how it's fallen short, and how we don't admit it to ourselves, all these things. So look here. Bring the light of your awareness to this issue right here. By focusing on the breath, we put ourselves in the right place to watch. Because taking the breath as our foundation, it gives us a place where we can step outside our thought processes to watch them, as the Buddha says, as something separate. Not so much that we're doing these things, but these things are happening in the mind, and watch them and see what happens as a result. And because the breath is the point where the mind and the body meet, we're in the ideal position to watch mental actions and physical actions and verbal actions all at the same time from this one standpoint. So there are lots of good reasons to stay with the breath. Keep reminding yourself of that. This gives rise to the quality that is called chanda. It's one of the bases for success in the meditation. But it also gives rise to understanding. Many times we focus on the breath and after you're out of after it You've been at it for a while, you tend to forget why you're doing it. So keep reminding yourself, you're here to put the mind in the right spot to understand itself. It gives you both the motivation you need to stick with the practice and the perspective you need to make sure that your practice stays on course. <laughs>